Hey, you look at my closet studio. Except it came out of the dungeon, and uh, I'm up here in my living room. See, I tidied up for you. So I love linguistics, and today I'm going to give you a little glimpse, a little intro into the world of linguistics. So buckle up. So uh, linguistics is divided into five areas of study: the P side, the S side, and morphology. So we have phonology, phonetics, morphology, syntax, and semantics. I think I talked a little bit about this in my last um, linguistics video, which was about how Canadians sound funny and the phenomenon of Canadian raising. Um, but I'm gonna just give you a little more in-depth um, overview of each of these areas. So first we have phonology. Phonology deals with phonemes, which are the fundamental building blocks of language. Phonology tries to answer the question, what are the distinct sounds that make up a language? Any language. Not all the languages, just a particular language that you're trying to study. So phonemes are sounds, but they're not just random sounds. They're sounds that are distinguishable from each other and that are used to make words. Determining phonemes can be trickier than you might think uh, because sometimes sounds are not distinct from each other. They're just variations of the same sound. And when that happens, they're called allophones. When they're distinctive from each other, they're called phonemes. One way linguists do this is by identifying minimal pairs. Because as I mentioned before, linguists don't necessarily uh, know a whole bunch of different languages but they know how to study different languages. And so if you're studying a language, but you don't know anything about that language, there's pros and cons to that kind of a situation. Because if you know the language really well, if it's your, if it's your native language, for example, it can be difficult to analyze your language from a scientific point of view, because you're too close to it. It's hard for you to identify things because it's ingrained in your brain. You just, you just know how things work. But of course, if, you're if you are analyzing a language you've never even heard before, then that's a whole other different set of challenges that you face. So one of the things that linguists do is they identify minimal pairs in order to start setting out what the sound system of a language is. So an English uh, easy example is, uh, are the words fat and bat. So everything about those two words is exactly the same sound-wise, fat and bat except for the first phoneme. Fat, the first phoneme, is a labiodental fricative, voiceless fricative, which is f. And in bat, the first phoneme is a bilabial voiced stop. So those two are distinctive. If you say fat, it doesn't mean bat, and if you say bat, it doesn't mean fat. Those are two different words that have two different meanings. The only change is the sound that starts those words. So we can identify those as being distinct phonemes. Allophones are sounds that differ, but aren't distinctive. So one example is the alveolar nasal, or N, N. So if you use the two words no and tenth, we make that sound slightly differently. And it sounds slightly differently, although it may not sound any different to you. It doesn't really sound any different to me. So the word no, the way that I say it, my tongue starts at the back of my alveolar ridge, which is that ridge right behind your front teeth. That's the what we call the place of articulation for the nasal in no. But for tenth, my tongue comes between my teeth, so it's called an interdental nasal in that case. But of course, to my ear, they sound exactly the same, and if you're an English speaker, they might sound exactly the same to you. No, tenth. But they're different. Those are allophones. There's no distinction between those, more, those phonemes. Those are the same phoneme. And so once, once you identify all the different phonemes of a language, then you use those to transcribe what people are saying. This is called phonological transcription, as opposed to phonetic transcription, which I'll get to in a second, 
as I go through a little bit about phonetics. So once you categorize all the sounds of a language, you catalog all the different sounds, the distinctive sounds, then you have the phonological inventory of a language. And then you would use that to transcribe the words that people say. And the way that you do this, or, or the symbols that you use to transcribe, are identified in the International Phonetic Alphabet. And I'm sure I'll do a video where I go into transcription and the use of the, inter the International Phonetic Alphabet because it's one of my favorite things. It's one of the coolest things that I learned. I was really excited when I started learning how to transcribe words. Because people always complain about English being, you know, the spelling being totally random. Well, it's not random, but um, when people say things like that, what they're really saying is, why does it seem like there's a totally random set of characters that we use to make up a word? Like cough, right? That's spelled C-O-U-G-H. Um, but normally, I mean, I just talked about how fat started with an F, but cough ends in the same phoneme, but it's spelt randomly. And there's, there's reasons behind that. It's all about the history of the English language, the spellings that we inherited over time. But that's a problem, right? You can't just show somebody by the writing, uh, by how you write it in, the, in English. That doesn't tell anybody anything about how it sounds, really. You have to memorize it. And so the International Phonetic Alphabet allows you to have a one-to-one -one relation between phoneme and sound. And so there's only one character for each phoneme in a given language. So there's not, you know, if, if we were to look at the sound inventory for English, the phoneme inventory, there's going to be a different number than 26. That's just our alphabet. Okay, moving on. Phonetics. Phonetics is an experimental science that studies speech sounds from three viewpoints. Production, acoustics, and perception. Production being how you make the sounds physically with your mouth and your tongue and your teeth and your larynx and your glottis and your velum and all the different parts of your anatomy that you use to make the speech sounds. Acoustics is how the sound waves travel from wherever you generate those sounds in your body through the air. That's acoustics, those sound waves. And they measure sound waves and they look at uh, how the different production techniques affect the acoustics. And then perception, or when those sound waves hit your eardrum, how you perceive those sounds. So like I was just talking about in allophones, there's gonna, if you measure the sound waves between 10th and no, you're gonna see a difference. There will be a difference in those sound waves. So the, the production is different. The acoustics are gonna be slightly different because the production is different. But the perception is, is not different. Or in other words, you don't perceive a, dif a difference between those two sounds because they're allophones. So that's, that's what phonetics does. It looks at production, acoustics, and perception. And I just want to give a little shout out. As I was preparing this video, I was using my old textbook, Introduction, Introductory Phonology by Bruce Hayes. It's a great book. Um, you know, I don't know what volume they're on now because, you know, with textbooks, they change them, like the editions, they change them all the time. But um, I pulled that little description of phonetics right out of Bruce Hayes' introduction. So because phonetics deals uh, with all the different kinds of sounds, regardless of whether or not they're phonemes, phonetics needs a way to describe what's happening. And so it also uses the International Phonetic Alphabet, with, usually with the help of different uh, marks and symbols attached to the general morpheme or the general phoneme symbols, that, which we call diacritics to show you what's happening. So for example, on the 10th N, there'd be a little, a little kind of open box that goes underneath the N to show that it's a dental N. And uh, 
I'm going to put that on the screen right there. That's the diacritic for dental. So a phonemic transcription is going to be between angle brackets like this, or actually if you're looking at me, they're going to be like this, the words going that way. For phonetic transcription, that's indicated by being inside square brackets like that. Uh, and that tells you, okay, this is a phonetic transcription. So we're getting into the nitty gritty of actually what the sounds, uh, how the sounds are made and all the different ways that the sounds are interacting with each other. Whereas if it's, it's within angled brackets, then it's just telling you, these are the morphemes that are used in this transcription. Next is morphology. Uh, morphology is, it deals with morphemes. And morphemes are a building block in language that's made up of one or more phonemes. And morphemes generally serve a syntactic purpose. And I'll get into syntax in a second. Uh, the easiest way for me to describe morphemes is, is just to give you an example. And that's the plural in English. A plural morpheme in English can take one of four different forms. It can be s, it can be z, it can be ez or uz. Or it can be nothing. So you have cars. Car is the singular, of course. Cars is the plural, so that's the z. Cats. Cat being the singular, the plural being cats, and that's s. Faces. So that's, you know, face is the singular, plural is with the is suffix. And then fish. The singular is fish. The plural is fish. So this, the plural morpheme for fish is null. So it's theoretically still there, but it just doesn't make a sound. So those are, those are morphemes and morphology is the study of morphemes. Okay, next is syntax. Syntax deals with arranging words and morphemes into sentences. It concerns itself with the different parts of speech, like who or what is the subject and object either direct or indirect, of the sentence. And what is the verb? It describes how different verbs require different combinations of categories of words in order to make sense to speakers. Uh, I, I know that's like, just probably sounds like just a whole bunch of words, but syntax just deals with sentences uh, and how you build sentences and kind of the innate rules that speakers seem to follow in order to build sentences that each other can understand. And um, so to, in order to do that, it describes the different parts of a sentence and, and how they're made up. So with phonology, we had the smallest unit of language, um, sounds that are distinct from each other that we use to build words. Phonetics goes a little bit deeper than that. It goes real deep into the sounds, um, but it also works with phonemes. Morphology is a little bit bigger. It's, not, it's usually not words, but it's sounds, collections of one or more phonemes, or sometimes a null phoneme, or correction, sometimes just no sound that make up a morpheme. Syntax deals with collections of words and how they're used and bundled and uh, put into sentences. And syntax deals with a lot of things like, uh, you know, like meta metadata that you would put that's attached to a file, any given file, like if you have a word file, it has a bunch of metadata that's attached to it, tells you the title and all these other things. Well, syntax assigns metadata to the different parts of speech words and, and things like this. And they do that in order to describe what's going on because sometimes, just like I was talking about that null morpheme of the plural, well, sometimes there's, in order for them to be able to describe the rules that we seem to follow, they have to, they have to include something that doesn't actually um, appear in the sentence but it seems to be there because of how we use things. I know it's kind of theoretical and confusing if I just explain it that way, but to bring it to something that might be a little more familiar to you, we have word categories like verb, noun, article, preposition, but syntax uses these a little bit differently than your English teacher. English teachers don't usually understand syntax very well. And when they're talking about noun, they're not talking about the syntactic value of a noun. That's why they use this description, person, place, or thing. But that doesn't really get at the root of what a noun is, um, at least not for syntactic use. Um, 
And so with syntax looks at, it needs to, to have these categories of things to be able to tell you why you put different things in different places in a sentence. And so if you have um, a group of words, or a word or more than one word will make up a phrase, and a group of phrases will make up a, a clause, and, a, and a, a clause, one or more clauses makes up a sentence. And syntax describes how you do that. So uh, to give you an example, we have a very simple sentence, the dog runs. So the is an article, the definite article. Dog is the noun, and runs is the verb. And so the article attached to the noun make up the noun phrase, the dog. That acts as a unit, that's the noun phrase. And the verb, the verb phrase here is runs, which is the verb to run with the gerund s attached to it, which indicates that it's an ongoing action. <clears throat> and so this sentence is made up of one clause. Every clause always has a verb in it. And this verb phrase has a noun phrase attached to it. So it's noun phrase, verb phrase. The dog, noun phrase, runs, verb phrase. So as I'm sure you can imagine, it can get pretty crazy, pretty complicated once you try, start trying to describe all the unique ways you can build sentences in a given language. Um, syntax. Yeah, I keep my textbooks because I love this stuff. Here's an example of some, that's like a, a sentence tree. So you can see sentence, noun phrase, verb phrase, prepositional phrase, and they build these you know, crazy trees. And that's in the beginning half of the textbook. By the end, it's, uh, you know, they start getting even crazier. So, um, and that's, uh, sorry, Syntactic Analysis, The Basics by Nicholas Sobin. <clears throat> it gets pretty crazy, um, but super interesting. And lastly, but not leastly, we have semantics. Now this is the, out of, all of these words, phonology, phonetics, morphology, syntax, and semantics, semantics is the one that uh, actually gets used in everyday English. When you're disagreeing with somebody and it seems to be just about what meaning you're assigning to a given word and you're both talking about it having a different meaning, you'll say, that's just semantics. And uh, I don't know what semanticists think about someone saying that's just semantics because it's their life's studying work. But uh, semantics is all about meaning. It's describing how different words, phrases, and clauses interact with each other to change the meaning of the message being communicated. One of the things that semantics describes is ambiguity. So for example, I ate the banana wearing red socks. So am I wearing red socks or was a banana wearing the red socks? Probably I am, but you could picture a world where a banana was wearing red socks because, you know, you attach some legs to it and put the little red socks on it. That is called syntactic ambiguity because it's all about the structure. The structure is what gives that ambiguity. I ate the banana wearing red socks. I could have said, I was wearing red socks and I ate the banana, or I ate the banana that was wearing red socks. Either of those would take away the ambiguity, and that has to do with the syntax. Uh, another type of ambiguity is lexical ambiguity, and this usually happens when you have, this is to do with homophones. So example, that bark is the worst. Am I talking about a dog barking, or am I talking about the bark of a birch tree? It's impossible to tell without context. That's lexical ambiguity. And of course, ambiguity is an endless source of humor, jokes, stand-up comedy. Um, and the more deftly you can wield this tool of ambiguity for humor, you can, can create some, some really funny jokes and examples. Uh, but that being said, I haven't met a semanticist that was very funny. They tend to be pretty serious. Uh, okay, so that's your introduction to linguistics. In my next linguistic themed video, we'll start looking at phonology and start learning about one of my favorite things in the world, transcribing words using the International Phonetic Alphabet. Thanks.
watching if you want to see more stuff like this, like the video, and uh, ring that bell to be notified of new videos. Come out.